I'm Vamsi. Uh, I work as an engineer at Disney Plus Hotstar. Uh, today we'll be covering about our use cases of Sila in our company. About Disney Plus Hotstar, uh, it's a uh, subscription video on demand service uh, in India where users can stream video on demand. Uh, by 2019, we had around 300 million active users per month and we had a uh, highest concurrency peak of 25.3 million uh, during a sports event of Cricket World Cup in 2019. Uh, the use case we'll be like to uh, we'll be talking about now is of continue watching. As you are, you might be aware of uh, in streaming platforms when you go to the home page and pick any movie, or you search and pick any uh, movie and you watch it, uh, and then you pause it at some point of time and you go back to home page. You can still resume the movie and then watch it from where you left off. This is a feature which is continue, which is called continue watching. We support multiple variants of continue watching in Hotstar platform. Uh, the one use case is where like you watch on a web, uh, web player first and then you pause it, you go to another tab, watch something else or like do some work and then come back to homepage again in web and you can resume it from there. That is on a single client. This is how it happens. Like when the homepage, you'll see a new tray, which is continue watching, uh, where you'll have the uh, like movie uh, stored until the timestamp where you watched before. You can click on it and resume it back. So. In addition to that, you can uh, sub, uh, have this uh, handoff of continue watching across uh, clients. Let's say you watch it on web, uh, a episode for uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, and then you uh, pause it there and then you can go back to your iPad or like iOS or Android device and then you can resume it from there. This is cross-platform feature of continue watching. And uh, the other use case is where uh, you watch an uh, episode uh, of episode one of let's say one series like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and, and then episode two and then you um, go back and do your work and then come back to Hotstar homepage again you will be seeing uh, season and episode three uh, in your continue watching. This provides seamless experience for the user so that he can resume from where he left off in the series. It understands the season state. The other uh, popular use cases of uh, new episode uh, let's say you watch um, uh, a, a show until some point of time and then you finish all the like and then it completes the all available episodes then uh, you come back next week or like next day when the new show come uh, and then you'll be seeing that the episode is already lying in your continue watching tree. this provides a uh, seamless user experience for the user so that he can resume from where he left off as you uh, observed from the use case definition uh, this needs some cross-platform uh, uh, functionality so that you can resume from one platform uh, when you have actually paused the video on another platform. Uh, to do this, what we do is from the clients, uh, there's a watch video event sent back to the backend via gateway uh, from uh, to Kafka and from Kafka we process the event and then uh, the event process uh, does some logic and then stores it to Redis and Elasticsearch and then from there uh, if anyone wants to read, uh, if a user comes back to home page or he logs in for the first time, the call is made back to the backend which queries Redis and Elasticsearch to give the continue watching tray experience. This was the architecture which we had uh, pre sila And the data model we followed was uh, a user ready to list of content ready map for Redis and Elasticsearch is a document model where for every user and a content ready, we stored the list of fields. And uh, as you my guess like uh, having two data stores for this uh, led us to uh, like uh, scaling challenges and the list of challenges which we had were like uh, we had multiple data stores uh, for the same use case and each having their own data model like Redis is a key value store and Elasticsearch is a document store and uh, we had data which is uh, uh, in orders of TBs and as the number of users who are uh, coming to the platform increase are increasing day by day uh, and when the uh, high scale event happens, this becomes a difficult challenge to maintain this data. And then the cost which we incur for maintaining two data stores and at high scales uh, ended up being expensive for us. So uh, to redesign this, we have uh, come up with this new data model, which is based on the uh, like big table schema design. Uh, like we had a user table and a user content table where a user ID is a primary key in first table, which uh, when queried gives a list of content IDs, uh, which are in the continue watching tray. And there is a second table, which is user content table, where user ID 
is a primary key and country ID is secondary key and timestamp is actually stored in this table. So this way, com uh, combination of both these tables, we can satisfy our use cases of uh, first getting the list of content IDs for a user and then updating the timestamp for a given user and a content ID. There is an optimization which uh, we, we could have done again on top of this where we could have only gone with only one table of user content and do a prefix scan for this to get the list of contents. We explored the possible candidates at that time to move from a exist, existing Redis and ES solution to a big table solution. Uh, the obvious choice is like HBase, which uh, uh, has uh, big table implementation in open source uh, world. Uh, there's Cassandra as well, which uh, without the need for HDFS has a same data model and a database by its, and a full database by itself. And Scylla uh, is uh, like provides the same Cassandra API, and but it's a completely new. Um, new code uh, written from scratch with uh, like higher efficiency um, and DynamoDB which is a proprietary uh, solution from Amazon uh, in AWS where, uh, where we are currently hosted. Out of all these options we have uh, evaluated, we have gone with Scylla and why the reason for Scylla is like it doesn't have a high maintenance cost for HDFS uh, first thing uh, and uh, it has a separate data store by itself and we noticed that when we calculated the cost uh, the overall cost for writes uh, over a period of time when fully provisioned, Scylla uh, is actually better in terms of uh, write, uh, write cost for us. Uh, and the second, uh, the ma major driving factor for us was the low latency with respect to writes and reads. When the writes are less latent and the reads are also less latent, the user can pause video from one platform and then resume with another platform in very quick time. So this handoff will be very good and the user experience will be better. So when we did the initial uh, throughput benchmarks and latency benchmarks is what we noticed. We noticed that latencies were very good. The next part of the presentation is about how we migrated to Scylla. Uh, my colleague Bala will be explaining this in detail. Thank you. Let's talk about the migration to Scylla. Today we're going to talk about like three kinds of migration. Redis to Scylla, Elasticsearch to Scylla and Scylla open source to Scylla cloud. Redis to Scylla audio migration is like pretty straightforward in our case because our data models were like almost similar. Uh, from Redis, we took a snapshot uh, of a RDB file and once the RDB file is generated, we use an RDB to CSV converter to convert to a CSV file. Once the CSV file is generated, we use a SQL SH copy command to copy from CS CSV file to Scylla cloud. One important thing to notice here is your parallelism of number of threads uh, you use to copy from CSV to the Scylla cloud because in case if you if you increase the number of threads and uh, your load of your uh, of your Scylla cloud becomes more than hundred percentage, I mean if you're unable to handle the load, uh, then it may uh, it may lead to a write time modes and that may lead to the data uh, loss in your migration. Data uh, write uh, writes will be a uh, fail over there. So you have to be like very careful with the number of threads you use. Uh, and you can achieve the more parallel parallelism with this because uh, there is no uh, data, I mean, uh, database to database to migration. So your source cluster won't be affected in any way. This same uh, kind of a uh, uh, technique is used for Elasticsearch also. Uh, our document uh, JSONs were like converted to a CSV file and CSV files were copied uh, to the uh, Scylla cloud as well. Let's talk about how we cut over from our old architecture to the new architecture. As once you would have explained that we use uh, two kinds of uh, data sources like Elasticsearch and uh, Redis uh, for our uh, for our previous setup. Once the Scylla cloud uh, data migration is complete, we want to move this uh, move our reads also to the Scylla cloud. So we started writing the we started parallel writing our data to Scylla cloud. Once we have hundred percent confidence on the Scylla cloud, the data is like good. We just started reading from Scylla as well uh, with our API servers. Once that is complete, we just simply cut over our older connection with our older data stores. In this case, in this way, we just completely avoid any downtime of migrating from this older architecture to the new architecture. Before we move to the Scylla cloud, we also tried with Scylla open source also, and we had like a lot of data points over there. Uh, so we have to migrate those data also to Scylla cloud. We we handle we carried out like two kinds of approaches. One is SSH table migrator, and another is Spark migrator. SS table migrator is like just of migrating the SS tables from your Scylla uh, older cluster to Scylla newer cluster. I mean Scylla open source to Scylla cloud. This is like very straightforward because it's like a server to server uh, transmission of your data and it's like 100% safe because there's no doubt data loss because it is like a SS table migrator. So all the data in your older cluster will be migrated to the newer cluster. 
there's a bunch of stuff so on it like we just use a node tool to extract the snapshots out of it once the snapshot has been obtained from the each mission of your uh, your folder cluster just run the ssable migrator wala command this will just comp- just this copy this ssable uh, ssables from folder cluster to the newer cluster this we can run in batches or all at once like if you have like 15 nodes you can run all the uh, you can run ssable migrator from all the 15 nodes only thing to notice here is you shouldn't have again as as i said in the previous slides also you shouldn't have any write timeouts in your destination cluster as well as you are reading from the uh, older cluster which can be prod also uh, in this case your if your prod cluster is affected by this copies it, it may lead to your uh, downtime at your production system so it's better to run the batches of a uh, three or five like whatever it is fits for you uh, and also your uh, machines are not affected uh, because of your traffic Uh, it has to be very uh, critical on your uh, on your side you have to take your judgment uh, based on your parallelism which you want and how uh, how how severe is your downtime or how severe your uh, uh, your migration time has to be uh, and those kind of things come into picture when you uh, you calculate your parallelism here one important thing we noticed in ssable migrator is this is a con that it slowed down when we had a composite keys when there is a more than one key like primary key and secondary combination is present we we analyzed like why it happened and we 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 finally uh we finally understood that when we copy the ss table migrator uh, when we use the ss table migrator it copies the ss tables and it creates a new ss tables at the destination cluster instead of just copying it to uh, some storage uh, so because of this it has to create a new key and then it has to create the uh, create the tombstone and it has to create every uh, each and every everything which has to create when we have an update uh, basically so this is like a very complex uh, complex complexity for the ssl migrator to do uh, that's why it got slowed down and uh, to to avoid the slow down we just want to uh, speed up our process we uh, went to the spark migrator the spark migrator is very simple to do uh, if we have a proper steps in a hand basically uh, before we before we do is the spark migrator we have to have a pre steps also you know open source cluster export all the backups to the s3 uh, s3 or any cloud storage you wish for and post this has happened uh, you have to create a, create a new uh, a new a uh, new cluster in a parallel this cluster has to be big enough that it can handle all the data it can hold all the data in your know, previous cluster this this has to be like a single node mission uh, in order to avoid the cost as well as uh, for easier transmission of data from uh, open source to the new cluster uh, and this has to be like very big enough also to handle or uh, to keep all the data in your previous cluster uh, once this new cluster is created we will restore the data from the older backups once the back uh, once it is once the uh, data has been restored we start using the spark migrator to just read from the old uh, new open source cluster which we created and write to the sila cloud this step is like very fast because you are using a spark and you are and this is not even touching your uh, prod clusters so there won't be any downtime also uh, only thing to notice here is uh, you can give uh, as many as executors you want like maybe 100 400 or anything uh, only thing to notice again is it has to be parallelism with the amount of destination uh, cloud is uh, how much percentage of load is been handling as well as like how many number of write timeouts you are seeing there write timeout has to be absolutely zero uh, even in case of a single write timeout you have to consider your parallelism you have to reduce your executors uh, lower your executors and make sure that there won't be any write timeouts happening so that you won't face any data loss and 100% migration can be achieved recently sila has introduced a new tool called ini restore uh, which can take care of this entire step of like uh, taking the backups and creating a new node uh, and then restoring the backup again uh, to the new node as well and then we just all we have to do is just run a spark migrator to copy from the new cluster to the sila cloud just to a uh, couple of key points to notice in the spark migrator as well as for the other uh, migration steps which i explained here is Uh, in the spark migrator uh, you need to create a new uh, node which has to be very big so you may have a cost impact on it uh, so you have to be like uh, aware of that uh, aware of that include in your uh, migration cost before you uh, start doing it uh, in case if your migration cost is very less uh, then we need to reconsider your uh, migration strategy and go with it uh, but my personal opinion is like spark migrator was less costly uh, than the other migration which i have completed in last two three also another key important thing which i was repeatedly saying in last three migration is this uh, parallelism is uh, very critical on the right timeouts front uh, you shouldn't even see a single right timeout uh, in your on uh, your destination cluster even there is a single right timeout uh, in your destination cluster you may face the data loss and 100% data migration won't be achieved uh, so these are the key points uh, yeah that's all from me on the uh, data migrations let's go for qa